All right, now we're going to talk in chapter three about British North America. We are going to talk about quite a few things in this chapter, <clears throat> but here in this section one, we're going to do a quick introduction. So whether they came as servants or slaves or, or whatever, uh, the men and women that came to the American colonies created new worlds for sure. Native Americans saw their settlements grow into, you know, saw the uh, new fledgling settlements grow into these unstoppable, vast populations that kind of monopolized resources and turned the land into something completely different than what they were used to. Um, the colonies also developed during the 17th and 18th centuries have very, you know, uh, fluid labor arrangement arrangements, very, uh, they start to racially categorize people and uh, use that in, for the basis of slavery and it really does define the economy of the British Empire. Uh, North America, the mainland, originally up, was occupied by, you know, a very small, marginal groups of people that now becomes a very vast, broad empire, very prosperous colonies. But even still, they were pretty, you know, low in comparison to how much money they made compared to the Caribbeans and the sugar islands there. Um, but still... The colonial backwaters of the North American mainland, you know, you could have people that would, you know, ignore uh, kind of imperial officials. Um, they were very deeply tied to the Atlantic trade networks, and they had a very new and increasingly complex Atlantic world that connected the continents of Europe, Africa, and the Americas. As things across the ocean uh, particularly in Britain, kind of start to, to, to stir up. You have civil war, religious conflict, you know, nation building. Britain kind of develops this major society on both sides of the ocean. And as these settlements grow and mature and they develop into more powerful societies that are capable of warring against the natives and subduing these kind of internal upheavals, you see patterns and systems they kind of go on to shape the rest of American society for centuries, really. But none of those, none of those systems that kind of come about are more brutal and destructive as the institution of slavery is. And that's going to take us here to section two. So this really begins with a guy named um, the arrival of a missionary in Charlestown, Carolina in 1706. His name was Reverend Francis Lejeux. He very quickly became disillusioned with the horrors of American slavery. He met um, enslaved Africans that had been ravaged by the Middle Passage, uh, Native Americans traveling south um, that were enslaving enemy villages, and you know colonists that were terrified from invasions from the French and from the Spanish. And so he has this area that where slavery and death just surround him. And his biggest complaints were really reserved for his own countrymen, the English, honestly. They were, the English traders encouraged wars with the natives in order to purchase and enslave captives. And you need to remember for quiz purposes that the vast majority, majority of native slaves came out of warfare, okay? That the English were pushing the natives to, to go and fight wars in order to get a, a influx of slaves. So the English got most of their enslaved native captives from warfare. And so he looks at all of this. Uh, Lejeux looks around and he says, hey, you know, this is good that this is not good at all. And um, he really thought, you know, hey, we should baptize and educate these slaves. But even after doing that, that he didn't think that would really overcome the problem that, that slavery had uh, brought about. Then in the 1660s, it really marks a turning point for black men and women in the English colonies like Virginia and North America and Barbados in the West Indies. You have new laws that give legal sanction to enslavement of people for, of African descent for life. Um, it would be a permanent deprivation of freedom and separate legal status for enslaved Africans facilitating the maintenance of very strict racial barriers, skin color, becomes more than just a superficial difference. It became a marker of a transcendent, all-encompassing division between the two races, white and black. 
all 1600s racial thought did not point directly to what we now have this modern modern classification of racial hierarchy of sorts, but you have a guy named Captain Thomas Phillips, and he is the master of a slave ship in 1694, and he has kind of this this self-creed. He says, I can't think there is any intrinsic value in one color more than another, nor that white is better than black. Only we think it's so because we are so. So basically for Phillips, not every slaver saw black as worse than white or whatever. He just said, hey, slaves are profitable and I'm going to go where the slaves are. And that happens to be in Africa. War, again, was really the most common means for a colonist to acquire Native American slaves. Please remember that. Um, European legal thought at the time held that enslaving prisoners of war was not only legal, but they said it was more merciful. As a result of many of the wars that took place, the, the Peacock War, the Massachusetts Bay colonists sold hundreds of North American uh, natives into slavery in the West Indies. A few years later, the Dutch colonists in New Netherland enslaved Algonquian natives during the governor's, uh, Governor Kreef's War. All of these wars really end up with, with lots of Native American slaves being shipped all around North America. And so the English colonies, colonists in New England, they also end up trying to send some of their Native slaves to Barbados, right? But they... But Good for them, honestly, the Barbados Assembly refused to import any of the Native Americans coming from New England. And it's not because they had thought that they shouldn't be enslaved. No, they thought it would encourage rebellion. So then in the 18th century, 1700s, you have wars in Florida and South Carolina and the Mississippi Valley. It produces even more Native slaves. And these wars would emerge from, uh, you know, contests between the Natives and colonists for land. Um, and some of them were kind of manufactured just to acquire slaves. Um, but they were not merely illegal raids, you know, performed by slave traders. A lot of these, they estimate that 24 to 51,000 Native Americans were forced into slavery um, throughout the southern colonies by both Europeans and other Natives. Um, they did stay in the region some, in some ways. You know, they had Charlestown uh, south, in South Carolina, and they would ship them to Barbados, or Jamaica, or Bermuda. And, they, and the English colonists really just wanted to claim the frontier land, and they thought the Native American presence would create violence. And so to them, it was just the best way to get those Native Americans out of the way. Unfortunately, the Native Americans died really fast, and they were murdered or starved, from, you know, starved to death. And this growing plantation economy really required a more reliable labor force, and so you end up with a transatlantic slave trade providing that workforce. European slavers would transport millions of Africans across the ocean. It was a terrifying journey uh, known as the Middle Passage. Uh, there's quite a bit of writing that talks about this and, and that the in inadequate provisions and, and all of this desperation would lead a lot of these slaves to suicide. You have a guy named Alexander Falconbridge, who was a slave ship sur surgeon. He describes the suffering of the slaves from on board, you know, infections and disease because of uh, being in close quarters. They had dysentery, known as the bloody flux. It would leave captives lying in pools of excrement, chained in very small places. They could lose skin and flesh just from chafing against the metal and the wood, and that their bones would, it would chafe all the way to the bone. Others that described it, you know, talked about rapes and whippings and disease like smallpox and conjunctivitis aboard these slave ships. It was awful. The middle kind of had various meanings, the middle passage, but um, it was really just one leg of the maritime trade for sugar and other semi-finished American goods that, and manufactured European economies and for African slaves. For Africans, the Middle Passage was the middle leg of the three distinct journeys. First, you had the overland journey in Africa, 
to the coastal slave trading factories in the West. It was often a trek of hundreds of miles that they would have to walk. Second was the middle, which was the ocean trip that would last from you know, one to six months. And the third was something called acculturation, or known as seasoning. And this is where they would transport them to American mines and plantations and other places where they were forced to work. The impact of the Middle Passage on these cultures in the Americans is, Americas is still evident today. A lot of foods associated with Africans, such as kavat, cassava, uh, were originally imported to West Africa as part of the slave trade, and they were adopted by African cooks and brought to the Americans, where they are still consumed. West African rhythms and melodies live in new forms in the music and in all these different religious spiritualized uh, spiritual things that um, kind of synthesize drum beats and and. Even the African influences appear in like basket making and language, um, especially of like the Gullah people on the Carolina coastal islands. Recent estimates count between 11 to 12 million Africans were forced to, to cross the Atlantic in the 16th and 17th or 16th to 19th centuries. Now, remember that number for quiz and test purposes. Think about that: 11 to 12 million Africans were put on ships and shipped to the New World. And that doesn't even count the millions that died during the trip, okay? And so it was horrible, and obviously when abolitionists come along, they focus on the abuses of the Middle Passage first, for sure. Southern European trading empires like the Catalans and Aragonese, they were kind of brought into contact with the um, Levantine commerce in sugar and slaves in the 14th and 15th century. And the Europeans really make that first step in the Atlantic slave trade in the 1440s. When the Portuguese land in West Africa, they're looking for gold and spices and all these things. And they, br they start bringing slaves back to Europe to use as like domestic servants and stuff like that. Um, because they didn't need all of the slave for manual labor there. But that quickly changes when they get to the New World, and they would trade all kinds of things, uh, beads, finished cloth, rum, firearms, all these different things. And so this is how they kind of got that slave trade started. It was really the Portuguese. Then... They wanted to go to the British West Indies in the Caribbean. And so they set up a major port in Charleston, South Carolina. It becomes the leading port of entry for slave trade on the mainland. Okay, And interestingly enough, the Spanish did not agree with the, with the African slave trade all that much. And they also really wanted to hurt the English. So when the governor, the mayor of, of San Augustine, and you might want to and remember this, uh, write this down. When the, when the Spanish see what the English are doing, they want to make them look bad, right? They've had all these problems, so the Spanish issues this decree of sanctuary for the, the mayor of San Augustine. It's called, uh, his name was Castillo de San Marcos. And this decree of sanctuary basically said any slaves that were fleeing from the English colonies, if they would convert to Catholicism and swear an oath to Spain, that they would be set free. Okay? And so this was really big uh, kind of a attack, you know, a kind of a Cold War almost attack by the Spanish. Um, and it really shows that the English and the Spanish had very different ideas of race and what made someone a slave. And it's really important to understand that. They were definitely more open uh, to, than the English were, to the idea of, of, of race and, and that being a role in society. About 450 Africans land in British North America, which is a very small portion of the 11 to 12 million victims total, um, but a as a proportion of the enslaved population, there were more enslaved women in North America than any other colonial slave population. Enslaved African women bore more children than their counterparts in the Caribbean and South America, and this facilitated a natural reproduction of slaves on the North American continent. 
then in 1662, there's a Virginia law that stated that an enslaved woman's children inherited the condition of their mother. Okay, so if, if you're ever asked, hey, you know, how did they set up deciding, you know, who's a slave and who's not and all of this, it was through the lineage of the mother. And it was really an economic strategy, you know, um, and, it, and it basically said, hey, if you're born a slave, you stay a slave. Um, and it was a way to keep women uh, as slaves for life and then their children as slaves for, white, for life also, no matter who the father was. Most fundamentally, though, you have the emergence of modern notions of race that's very closely related to the colonization of the Americas and the slave trade. African slave traders lacked this kind of categorical classification of race that made them not really feel like they were selling their own people so much as, as they were just selling uh, people that were victims of, of war or whatever. They were just in it for profit. Also, even the English didn't have this idea of race being linked with skin color because most English citizens did not think they were the same race as like the Irish or the Wel Welsh. Even though they had the same skin color, they didn't see themselves as the same race, okay? This only really develops as a way to oppress in the modern Atlantic world. And so during the early years of slavery, especially in the South, this distinction between indentured servants and slaves was pretty unclear. But that, that Virginia law gets passed that makes African women tithable, which means you could, you'd have to pay taxes on African women, basically made uh, African women's work different than, uh, say, white women's work. And it's because there's no similar tax living on white women who are slaves. And so it was really an attempt to distinguish white women from African women based on race. The English ideal was to have enough hired hands and servants working on a farm that the wives and daughters didn't have to, you know, go and do manual labor. Instead, they could go work in the dairy sheds and small gardens and kitchens. But obviously, because of the labor shortage, women, white women still did have to do field labor. But it was just this idealized gender division of labor that contributed to the English conceiving themselves as better than other groups who didn't divide labor that way, including the West Africans who arrived on slave ships to the colonies. So a lot of white colonists, the association of the gender different divisions of labor with Englishness provided further justification for uh, enslaving and subordinating Africans. Ideas about the rule of the household were kind of formed by legal and customary understandings of marriage at home. Uh, a man was expected to hold you know, paternal dominion over his household, and that included his wife, children, servants, and slaves. But slaves were not actually masters of a household. They were therefore subject to the authority of the white master. Slave marriages were not recognized by colonial law. Um, they would Sometimes slaves would marry people that were outside of their plantation, and then they would have to get permission to go see their wives or their husbands. Uh, typically, they'd only be able to go see them maybe once a week on Sunday, right? Um, this legal and religious authority did also did not protect their marriages, and they could refuse to let their slaves visit a spouse or even sell the slave to a new master hundreds of miles away from their spouse and children. And it really set up a terrible, terrible system um, that, that, that would tear apart families and, and tear apart, really, um, an entire culture. So that kind of covers the idea of, of race and gender in terms of how it was divided. And then we'll pick back up with the turmoil that happened in Britain in section three.